Well, we're back again. This is with Joe from Red Judaism. He's right over here. You can't see him. He keeps himself uh, uh, closed behind that red mask of his for for, for or for a reason because of the kind of security that he has to be careful of. But what Joe is doing, he's coming, he's asking, uh, really, I've asked him to come on board to show us how you can look at the Quran, how you can look at the verses, and how you can go back and see what the original text really said. Because so much of the Quran that we have today, this book here, is an Abbasid invention. This is an Abbasid Quran. What it means is that it, came, it really came into being after 749, 750, the mid-8th century. The Quran that I have in my hand here, even, is the Hafs Quran. And the Hafs Quran, as you know, is a rendition that was created by a man named Hafs in 796, late 8th century, was not really chosen until 1924 out of 30 different Qurans. His was chosen from the late 8th century as the canonical text, and that's why we use it today. That's why everywhere all around the world, except for certain parts, this is the most. This is the the standard text by ninety five percent of all Muslims. Well, what Joe wants to do is he wants to go and look at this text, assuming that this is the earliest text. The, uh, that's the Arabic, the Rosum. Assuming it's the earliest text that we can look at, it's the one that is because it's the one that everybody uses today. He's going to show you a key that you can use. All of you can use to unpack each one of these verse, verse by verse by verse. He's going to show you a series of different steps you can take. I think there are 11 steps with the 12th one, uh, which has to do with, he, uh, he's going to put it out there. If you cannot do it, then you can actually get money from him. He's going to put that out in my career. Uh, Joe, you're over there. Is that true? You're actually putting money on the line for this? Yes. Well, there would be a reward if I find that somebody can has gone through the steps and they genuinely have gone through the steps and they haven't been able to um to solve it then they can contact me and if i can't solve it with them then there will be a reward because i've been looking for something which which will break the code you know it's like i'm testing the hypothesis so if you can if you can find something which will break this code and doesn't work according to this code then um then uh, yeah there'll be a reward when people want to interpret um uh, a verse, they can take a, any verse out of any scripture, take it out of context and give it a, an interpretation based on their own feeling, how they feel. But what they can't do is um, find a, a consistent code which works on every single verse and produces the same, uh, uh, and it fits in the same sort of, um, uh, what do we say, same paradigm. Um, they have to, uh, so, so, what we, so what we've got here is not a, taking a verse by verse and saying, let's interpret it according to our feeling. It's saying, we have a code here. We have a system, a troubleshooting key. And if we apply this key to any verse which is thrown at us and said, this is the last final message to all of mankind, and we use this consistent um, steps, then we can find that we have a very different message coming from uh, those passages. All right. You've all heard it out there. There are 11 steps that he's now going to walk you through. Let's go and share it with us, and let's see what these 11 steps are. So in the last episode, we looked at the meaning of the word uh, Quran itself um, as uh, meaning the lectionary and how it refers actually to Old Testament readings and not to what we call the Abbasid Quran. We also looked at the word Asana al-Hadith, Hadith, and we saw that the word Hadith appears many times in the Quran. I didn't go through each passage, left that for you to check yourself. Um, and um, you'll have to have checked the Arabic, but you'll see that this word hadith comes again and again. That this text, which we're calling the Abbasid Quran, has got this remnant of information, a remnants of um, text in it, where it actually refers to itself as a hadith, not as a Quran. So you're going to show us what the pre-Abbasid Quran is. This is prior than the 9th and 10th century of Quran. That's right. So we've seen that basically claim that there's the Hafs is based on this Huff version. We've looked at some of this um, in the previous episode. We looked at the, a list of um, verses on, on the word Hadith in it. And um, are there any more 7th century Hadiths in the Abbasid Quran? Well, since the Abbasid Quran is based on um, 7th century Hadiths and despite redaction still refers to itself as a Hadith, can we find any more remains of this 7th century Hadith uh, these, these 7th century hadiths contradicting the Abbasid religion buried in the Abbasid Quran? Well, first of all, we have to know what to look for. And so this is the key. This is, this is how you can find different meanings from these uh, 7th century um, hadiths 
uh, which contradict and are, are, are in conflict with the standard Abbasid narrative. So the first thing that you should do um, when uh, somebody has come to you and, and presented you with a verse and says, this is the final revelation for all mankind, it's clear message, and this is the interpretation, listen to the allegation, but don't accept the translation as we've seen. It's still even evolving today. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that even after this video, somebody out there is going to be ad editing and adjusting uh, meanings in, in different places. But listen to the allegation first. Don't accept the translation. Step two, this is like a troubleshooting thing. Open something like corpus.quran.com um, or another word for word source. You've got to go to these word for word sources to be able to get to the bottom. Now, it might be as soon as you see the verse in the word-for-word -word source that the problem has been solved, that you've, you've already instantly um, dismissed the, uh, the claim that this is one meaning for all of mankind and perfectly clear. Because when you go to the word-for-word, the -word, you're probably going to find that it, it didn't agree with the translation that you were given. For example, we saw in the last episode when Jay was looking for the word hadith in, in, in his Quran, and it wasn't there. When you go to a word-for-word -word source, and there are plenty of different ones, but I recommend if you're using the internet, you have access to the internet, corpus.quran.com is a good one. When you go to the word-for-word -word source, suddenly a lot of that is going to be immediately thrown out of the window. The, the allegation will fail immediately. Okay, so that's uh, uh, corpus.quran.com. Or uh, another word-for-word -word source online is Quran Gateway which has all of Dan Brubaker's uh, uh, works on it too. And that's also got a word for word search function on it too. So that's another good one. You might find still in some Islamic bookshops, they might have some published word for word uh, books, which are a little bit more difficult to use, not so easy, but um, they have been disappearing out of the, the Islamic bookshops more recently in more recent decades, but they might still have some word for word uh, sources there. But that's the first thing you've got to do. Listen to the allegation, then go to the word for word, probably, it's going to fail at that point. If it doesn't, go on to step three. Now, step three um, is that uh, you're going to have to revert the words Allah, Al-Rahman, and Al-Rahim to Father, Son, and Spirit. This is probably going to be a bit of a shock to you because you've probably thought to yourself that there is no Trinity in the Quran. In fact, the Trinity does exist in the Quran, but it's just got a slightly different way of... Um, uh, of, of being presented than standard classical sort of modern uh, Roman Christian um, view on the Trinity. I've got a little diagram to explain it, so I'll, we'll open it up and have a look. So this is the standard Roman Christian Trinity as we understand it. Uh, that's basically probably well known to most of you out there. I just took this uh, image off the internet when I looked for Roman Christian Trinity so it's not me that's saying this. I, I, I am assuming that that's the case. You know, I come from a, a Judaic background. Um, and um, so it's not uh, my fault if this is not correct. But I, I'm assuming that that's, that's a pretty classical interpretation of the Trinity from the Roman Christian point of view. That's not what you're going to find in the Quran, obviously, even when you redact it back to the Umayyad texts. But there is a Trinity in the Quran. It looks like this. So this is the Trinity as described in the Quran. It's a bit unusual, um, but we have one God, the Father, as in the Creed. This is based on the Nicene Creed. You know, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. So one God, the Father, is, is there as part of the Nicene Creed. And this one God, the Father, is homoousios, which is a word from the Nicene Creed, meaning one being with or one essence with. And it is homoousios with the Spirit. So if the one God, the Father, is the Spirit, is the homoousios Spirit. God is spirit, as it says in the New Testament. And also, the Son is homoousios with the spirit. So they are one being, homoousios, but it's a, sort of a linear progression. The, the spirit comes from the Father, or as it says in the Nicene Creed, proceeds from the Father. And in the Nicene Creed, um, the ousios, it says that the Son is begotten of the ousios of the Father begotten of the essence of the father sometimes is translated so that's the nice hey, hold, hold, hold. let me just let me just make sure i'm uh, understanding you're saying this is the quranic trinity yes it is yeah you're this saying that the, 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 the quran does support the fact that the the fa that the god has a son or the father oh, has sorry. a son you, you you caught me out there we said quranic and i said yes it is i should have said no not the abbasid quran we're not talking about the abbasid quran uh we're talking about the umayyad hadiths this is the umayyad make sure hadith you make that trinity. distinction so 
We're not okay. talking about the Quran we have in our hand today, because I know no. every Muslim will shut you down, saying this is one of yeah. the first. This is one of the first things they throw at us. How could God have a son? So you're yes. talking about the or the proto Quran would have this view. This is in those Umayyad texts. If you follow this uh, key that I'm giving you, you're going to see this Trinity again and again in okay. the um, Umayyad texts. By the way, when you said is this Trinity in the Quran, um, I'm understanding it. Because in my mind, I'm, I'm trying to fix the word Quran equals Kayana equals Mikra, which means Old Testament readings. And the answer is yes, this is the Trinity as described in the Old Testament. But um, it's not in the Abbasid Quran. No, this is not, <laughs> not in the Abbasid I'm going to keep asking you this so that, because so yes. if I didn't uh, hear what you're saying, the others aren't going to hear what you're saying. Okay, continue on. Thank so, you. So I hope, it's, I hope it's clear. So this is the Trinity you're going to find in the, in the Umayyad texts. And it's kind of in the old, as I said, in the old, in the old Testament readings, the Mikra, the Karayana, the original Quran that the Umayyad texts are referring to. It is not in the Abbasid Quran. It is not part of the Abbasid religion. And it's just another proof you're going to see in the verses which we're going to examine over the coming uh, uh, shows how um, these, these texts completely contradict and undermine the Abbasid religion. Or you might say the standard Islamic narrative. Or the standard Islamic narrative. Um, so, um, so that's the first thing. So you're going to have to revert the words Allah, Al-Rahman, and Al-Rahim back to Father, Son, and Spirit. And that might get rid of um, um, many of the allegations which are presented to you. You will find that this is consistent throughout the entire Quran. You might think, hold on a second, all you're doing here is just is just changing. There's a kind of a bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim. There's just kind of a, in the name of Allah, the, the, the merciful, the benevolent, the merciful at the beginning of all these verses. So you just replaced it with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the, 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 the fact that al-Rahman is always going to be fitting with verses about the Son, and the fact that al-Rahim is always going to be fitting with verses about the Spirit, according to this Trinity image which I just gave you, is, is um, well, I mean, how many times does it have to be a coincidence before it stops being a coincidence is obviously beyond probability. Um, it's beyond probability. Incidentally, also the word Allah itself. Um, this name, Al Allah, um, is actually an, a euphemism to protect uh, pronunciation of the sacred name in, in Judo-Arabic. In Judo-Arabic, it, it's actually representing a Hebrew name of God. Uh, Jay, do you know which name of God we're talking about? Yeah, the, uh, this is what we were talking about earlier, and that's El Eloha, which you can't say publicly, but I can. Yes, and that's uh, the God of Israel. This name appears uh, several times in the Old Testament. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the, the titles of God. But um, we can pronounce it if we remove one of those letters, one of those letters. So it's no longer a sacred name. It's no longer a sacred text. It's no longer a prayer. We can talk about it in a secular context by saying El La, because we've, we've removed that Aleph in the middle between the two L's. And now it's, it's just a, a common way of talking about God, which is quite interesting because it shows that the fact that this way of spelling it is appearing in these Umayyad texts proves that these Umayyad texts were never meant to be taken as sacred literature. If it was, then they wouldn't have removed the Aleph between the two there. This is a, a name which we use in Judah Arabic to refer to God the Father, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's been euphemized. So anyway, we've got that step there. So if, if, if step three didn't work and suddenly the, and the passage that has been thrown at you is still not looking pretty Christian, um, then, or at least Hebrew messianist, messianic, messianic Jewish, if you like, then there's a fourth step you can use, and that's to apply tripartite Christology. Okay, tripartite Christology. Um, I'm going to have to open up a little image for you to have a look at. So tripartite Christology, what is tripartite Christology? It's um, something which uh, many um, traditional Christians will be familiar with. It's the idea that Jesus has sort of three roles as prophet, priest, and king, or he is also the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and it's also um, uh, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, he appeared in, in what's called theophanies, um, or, or sometimes called Christophanies. Um, and those three forms which he appeared in the Old Testament are the uh, angelic messenger of the Lord, or the, um, the word of the Lord, or the spirit of the Lord. And you'll find that these three 
um, sort of uh, this. This is how he appears in the Old Testament through through as in the in the theophanies. If you believe that um, Jesus the Messiah is appearing in, in the old in the Old Testament, that these are the three ways in which he appears. He appears as the angel of the Lord, the word of the Lord, and the spirit of the Lord. It's like the angel of the Lord appeared unto so and so, or the word of the Lord came unto so and so, or the spirit of the Lord came to this prophet. And this is how this is how he's referred to in the um, in the Old Testament as a the word. Uh, uh, the spirit and the um, uh, and the angelic messenger. Um, in fact, the word for an angelic messenger um, uh, in 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 Judaism, an, an, arch, an archangel, is uh, is um, is a Rashi a Rashi Malka. So this is this Rashi. You can hear the kind of the idea of Ras Rasul in here. This is actually Ras. It, it kind of reminds you of the Arabic. There's actually a, a, a linguistic connection, if you like, between the two, because there is no linguistic connection between the Arabic word Rasul and the Hebrew word Shaliach, which means messenger. But in this Rashi, there is actually a Ras, there is this sort of connection. So Rasul is the archan archangel, the, 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 the angel of the Lord, the angelic messenger. So these are the three forms which Jesus appears in the Old Testament. And this is the, the, what we call a, a tripartite Christology. In the same sort of sense, it's like if following the, the, the Nicene Creed, if, if, if Jesus is God from God, light from light, then he's also kind of a trinity from trinity as well. There's a little bit of a tripartite kind of identity in him. And so that's another thing you have to be aware of. In fact, the Quran uses this phrase. It refers to him as the Rasulullah, the Kalimatullah, and the Ruh Minhu. So it means that he is the messenger of God, the word of God, and the spirit from God. So that is the tripartite Christology, which you're going to find in the Quran. And if this, so this is the, the next step which you've got to look at. So if applying the tripartite Christology um, hasn't, still hasn't worked and still hasn't made uh, sense of a verse that you've got the Quran, which is completely different to what they are telling you that it, the verse means, then we have to think, um, is it against modalism? Step five, is it against modalism? So modalism, I've got a little uh, image of modalism to help. So modalism, Sabellian modalism, I've got it up here. Um, with three other kinds of Christology for you to compare it to, because it's I, I found it pretty difficult to, to to get one picture which couldn't could not be confused with other forms of Christology. But Sabellian modalism is certainly not what the Umayyad texts are about. Certainly, the Umayyad texts do not like Sabellian modalism. And Sabellian modalism is very basically the idea that the, the father became the son. Um, at the incarnation, a temporal event which happened between 1 BC and 30 AD, roughly, roughly, and then became the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so the, the Father sort of transforms into the Son and the Son transforms into the Holy Spirit. But essentially, it's one being who takes on different modes depending on what he wants to do. Um, sometimes it's been talked about as, as being like um, ice changing into water and then changing into um, vapor. But not that these three things exist all um, simultaneously um, in their different states, but they only exist as one entity, one thing which transforms into these different states, depending on what that entity wants to achieve. So that's Cybelian modalism um, um, uh, in a sort of a classical understanding. And, and I believe that there are no uh, Cybelian modalists in the world today or anybody who, who follows Cybelian mod modalism in the world today. But that's certainly one of the things which the um, Umayyad texts uh, does not like and, and, and uh, sort of stands against it. I'm not going to talk about the other three images on this uh, slide. I've only put them there for comparison so you can see what I'm trying to get at with this Sabellian modalism in comparison with some three other kinds of Christology. Okay, I think that's all that needs to be said about that. So now, if step five hasn't solved your problem and given you... Um, a completely different interpretation from the first which has been given to you, it might be time to go on to step six. Is it against tritheism? Okay, so this is tritheism. This is not a trinity. These are three gods that sort of uh, operate and go around together doing different things in a, in, in a team. It's a kind of a teamwork. It's, it's classical paganism. It's polytheism. Um, it doesn't matter that... Um, Maybe one of these gods is, is kind of many things in one, but the other two gods are, are, are not. And um, 
they work as a team. This is basically the classical sort of understanding of tritheism. When you have um, misunderstood the concept of the, the oneness of God, which exists in the Judo-Christian tradition, to the extent that you now have three gods sitting down around the table, devising, um, making decisions by committee, so to speak, or even working on different things and possibly even in conflict with each other, this is uh, tritheism. And it's very important to note this very key point. There is a word in Arabic, a very ancient word in Arabic for the Trinity. And that word in Arabic is al-thaluth, al-thaluth. Uh, this word, if the, um, if the Umayyad texts were opposing, fighting against the Trinity, uh, there is absolutely no doubt at all that the word al-thaluth should appear in those uh, Arabic texts. And yet it doesn't. It doesn't appear. Not once in the entire, uh, uh, in the entire modern Abbasid Quran. It doesn't even, it didn't, it, uh, even after all of the censorship and redactions and edits that it went through, even in the modern Hafs version of the Quran, the word al-Faluth, which is still the, 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 the uh, has been consistently the word for the Trinity, it is still missing from the Hafs Quran. What they have instead is the word Thalatha. Can you hear the difference? Al-Thaluth and Thalatha. Thalatha means three. And the, uh, the, even the modern uh, Hafs version of the Quran is only criticizing Thalatha, those people who say they are three gods, not those people who say there is a trinity, Al-Thaluth. So that's another point. If it's saying, if it's speaking out, if you look and you followed the process of looking for the words word for word, and you see the word thalatha there instead of al thaluth, then you know it's not criticizing the Trinity, it's actually criticizing tritheism. Other people who followed tritheism were also the Gnostics. While they may have been even more than uh, Gnostic Christianity, um, had many, many um, deities, but three, fun, three important deities in Gnostic Christianity was the concept of the father the mother and the son as three, three divinities, three deities. And one example of um, Gnostic Christianity is something called Coleridianism, which you can go and have a look at if you want to do some more research into tritheism and Gnostic uh, Christianity. To a certain extent, it's sort of continued today in the, in the Mormon church, but not very much, not very much. It's similar, but not, uh, not identical. Is this okay, what so we, that's tritheism. Is, is this yes? an example of this would be chapter five, verse 116, where Allah says to Jesus, is it true you and your mother are, uh, you, are yes. do we did worship as God? Yes, did you tell them to take me and my mother as gods yes, besides gods. Allah? Yes, and, and it uses the, two, the dual case there, two gods besides Allah. It's interesting it uses the dual case there because um, it's actually um, more like a, that verse specifically is, is, is more like a kind of a, 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 a dualistic um, mother and child uh, religion. Rather, which which has no mention of the father, but there is there are other verses which said um, they have surely disbelieved to say uh, the father is the third of three. Allah is the third of three. Um, this would be a, a perfect example of calling tritheists disbelievers. Um, but this verse with did you tell them to take me and my mother as two gods instead of Allah, and it uses that dual case two gods um, could be referring to. Um, uh, what may be mariolatry, where, where almost to the point where you've got the father has been excluded and they're just literally worshipping the mother and the child. But it's again a kind of, uh, a kind of Gnosticism because there are uh, some Gnostic sects which focused more on the mother and the son and completely excluded the father as being a sort of a demiurge evil creator so they were they most were these... muslims who talk about the 51116 do assume that the father is implied that it's father saying is it true that you too are also gods along with me and that's the trinity that that the quran's confronting which is odd since uh there are there are very few people i know christians that i know that they would have mary as part of the trinity but then you see again the word thaluth is not there the word trinity is not there. It's very clearly speaking about multiple gods, which is more like tritheism or polytheism, and isn't at all like Trinity, where we have one god. Understood. And, and so said, that would be a that would be another example. Is all I'm asking. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yes. In that case, yes, I understand what you're coming at. So the point of it is that the the word thaluth is just not there. Yeah. That's okay. Trinity. It's just not there. 
All right, let's go on. So now, if after eliminating all of this possibility so far, you still find that the verse is basically saying what they say it's saying, it's time to think about step seven. Is it really against, uh, for example, they'll say it's against Jews and Christians, for example. Is it really against Jews and Christians or is it against Judaizer and Nazarene adoptionists? Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail of the Judaizers and Nazarenes because the uh, it, um, um, Odon Lafantan uh, has already gone into great detail on the, on the Judo Nazarenes and what they believed. And, and also uh, Thomas Alexander has gone into great detail about this sort of Nazarene um, uh, uh, sort of judo christianity although of course Thomas alexander doesn't um know and not is not interested in any kind of judaic explanation for any of these things he's only looking at it from a purely sort of uh christian point of view but essentially what he's describing are these nazarenes who, who he might call christians and i would call uh judo judo nazarenes judaic group um, and uh, the adoptionist ideas that these sects have essentially comes out later in uh, is in islam with something called ittihad, uh, which is the concept of being one or achieving union with the divine, which is, is there in Sufism today. It's there in imamism. Uh, it's, a, it's very much a concept of Abbasid Islam. It's mystical union with the divine. So um, most famous verse, of course, you'll, you'll um, probably all be thinking of is the verses where it says that the, um, it says Al-Yahud uh, says, say that Uzair is Ibn Allah, uh, Al Yahud say Uzair is the son of God, and the um, Nasara Nazarenes say um, uh, Al Masih uh, Ibn Allah, and they're both they're both wrong. So this it will be presented to you as as being against Jews and Christians, but um, the correct word for uh, Jew used or Jews used in the Quran is actually Hudan, um, and the word Yahud is literally a translation or Al Yahud is literally a translation from Syriac uh, Yahuda which is the name Judas, traitor, or uh, Judaizer. So um, and if, what we actually have there is not a reference to Jews, but people who have abandoned Christ to become more like Jews in the way they perceive it without actually uh, con contacting, I suppose, Jewish uh, community and trying to learn about Judaism, and just perceiving it. And uh, the word Uzair ibn Allah, Uzair, everybody tells you that this means Ezra, Ezra is not uh, a prophet. It's, there's, a, there's another word in Hebrew, Ezra, which has got a slightly different ending. It's actually harder, Ezra, as opposed to ez, Ezra. There's a, there's a difference between it. The Ezra refers to a home-born Jew, somebody who is, is born to Jewish parents. Um, and the idea is that these people, um, the Judaizers, um, will almost start worshipping Jews to a saint by saying, well, every home-born Jew is a son of God. Um, not just Jesus, every homeborn Jew is. So Jesus is nothing special. If you're a Jew, you're a son of God. Therefore, you know, that's that they, they turn their backs on Jesus. They, they, they Judaize, they, they become the Judas, they become the betrayer, they betray Jesus. And they go to this sort of um, this, this, this idea that they almost worshiping uh, Jews. So that's the Judaizer, the Nazarene, but this just Jude, the, these, the Jews, of course, not actually, physically God's children, but are in union with God, are in itihad with God. And the Nazarenes, also the adoptionists, the same word is used again, uh, itihad is the word which is used for the Nazarene adoptions. You see criticisms about this again and again in the Quran. Most verses when it says, uh, for example, Allah or the father does not have a son, the word you're going to see there is this word for adoption, which is itihad. That's the word you're going to see in those verses. So is it against Judaizers? Is it against Nazarenes adoptionists? Does it have the word itihad? If so, then uh, you've got your answer. It's not against Jews and Christians. It's against adoptionists who are, who are people who, who believe that, yes, Jesus was may have been a Messiah, but he was not the Messiah. He was just like uh, adopted as God's son in the same way that Solomon was or that David was or that Saul was and that anybody can be if they are of that lineage. So the, the Judo Nazarenes, it's been spoken about a lot, um, were people who claimed, uh, Odon's mentioned this, claimed to be of the scions of the house of David, or, house, or the scions of the house of Jesse, Nazarene, Netzarim, scions. That's the, that's the word. And they believe that in every generation, uh, the, there is one of them who is um, the Messiah of, 
of the time, the Messiah of the day, and can be adopted as God's um, child, ready, to, ready and waiting to be adopted as God's child. This still exists in Sufism. If you go through a Sufi order in, in Islam, the, the grand master of the Sufi order will be essentially in communion, in union, mystical union, itihad, adopted by God uh, and in union with God in that sense. Or it exists in the imamism, when you have the, 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 the chief imam of the Shiite sect is literally in union with God. So in, oddly enough, the uh, Umayyad texts are completely condemning such Islamic uh, groups. And that's the se step seven. So if that hasn't solved your problem, you can ask this question. Is it against Mesopotamian paganism? That is, is it using the word shirk? Shirk. Is the word shirk there? That's the associators. The Mesopotamian pagans, um, basically we're talking about um, the, the uh, it's a very ancient idea which spread to different sects uh, over the times, but essentially the, Zora, the Zoroastrian leaders of the Sasanian Empire, for example, Khosrau himself, had a similar idea to the adoptionists uh, that he had become the greatest god. And the um, emperors, the Shahan Shah, the king of kings of every uh, of, of the Sas Sasanian dynasty, every Sasanian Shahan Shah, king of kings, was essentially one with God in the same sort of way. And so you'll see um, sometimes that this word shirk or sharika will come always in reference to um, very close by when it's mentioned adoptionism. So it might be talking out about um, uh, Nazarene adoptionists. It'll use the word um, uh, itihad and it'll say that he, he has not adopted a son. And then it'll also say, and there is no uh, partner or there is no associate with him. There is no la sharika luhu, which means then there's no associate, meaning he, neither he didn't adopt a child and the Persian emperor is not uh, is not one with him either. So it's basically saying uh, it's, it's it, it'll 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 put those two together. Okay, so if it hasn't uh, already uh, completely undermined whatever the story has been given to you, and, and it's given a completely different definition by now, there's step nine. But before we get that, and it's in step eight, is that then what you see on the Dome of the Rock, where you have Laila Ilala Arsharkatu? So you have the reference that God is one when uh, that. Uh, he is not an associator. He knows uh, they're on the Dome of the Rock and also on the coins. Is that yes. what you're referring to here? Yes, because you know the um, the Persian emperors used to put themselves on the coins, and they sometimes even refer to themselves as Yazadta, which is, means God in uh, Yazid or is, is is another form of it. Yazadta is means God in in the in the Persian language or the old Persian language, and uh, so they had removed those references to um, Yazadta, and they were saying. And now God has no no associate. He has no partner on uh, in his um, in his um, um, sovereignty on the earth. Um, that would apply to uh, the idea of like a divine right of kings as well, if you like. So his this this um, this idea comes from this Mesopotamian paganism. Basically, all the old Mesopotamian rulers considered themselves essentially gods. They appointed themselves as gods. So. So it's it these verses and the one you mentioned on the Dome of Rock actually does come directly after mentioning adoptionism. It uses the word itachad again. So it says he did not adopt a child and he has no um, he has no um, uh, like earthly counterpart, so to speak. That's the, well, let me let me just take it one step further though, yeah. isn't it? I mean, yeah. Yeah. when when uh, Thomas was going through all of the inscriptions of the Dome of the Rock, when he came to this yeah. word sharkatu. Uh, which is reference to Sherk. He applied yep. that not to pagans, but to Christians himself. It is the Christians who believed because of John 3, 16, he, for he is the adopted, he is the son of God. Therefore, he begetteth nor is he begotten. That's also on the inscriptions. That's against John 3, 16. And the Sharkatul or the Shirk, the idea of Shirk is a, a, a polemic against the Christians who have, they believe, have elevated Jesus alongside God. Therefore, they are the associationists. You're saying that the associationists or uh, the, the reference here is against paganism. Wouldn't it also be against the Christians yeah. at that time? No. Uh, I'm going to basically blow all of those ideas out of the water when I examine those, um, those verses. Um, this is really an example of, again, of inheriting and trying to, you, you, a lot of people, they can't get past it. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's sadly something which also I think Odon mentioned as well. But it's, it's the, the influence of the Abbasid hegemony 
it's so strong, it's so powerful that if you've been exposed to it, it's almost like you can't see past it. But you cannot use those opposite ideas when you're looking at these on my texts. I'm going to explain, of course. Okay, in, okay. In, in no one's saying. Okay, I, I agree with that, course. Joe. In due course, but Joe, yeah. Joe, this yeah. is on the Dome of the Rock. So this is not Abbasid. This is the late no, no, 7th no. century. It's and just it the way is you. Of the yes, Malik, it's just who the way is you a, read. It's just an interpretation. It's not a. Every, uh, look, we, let we'll me finish. Let me finish. First. Joe, yeah, let me finish. We do have these references, and it's very clear that almost all the references on the inscriptions are against Jesus' divinity, against the Trinity, and I'm against I'm going to blow it out his... of the water, Jay. I'm going to blow it <laughs> okay. out. You're going, to, you're going to be... You're not going to like what we've done earlier then, because I... Yeah, but if you... And it's ironic that, 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 for example, Thomas was talking about, um, like, um, um, Christoph Luxemburg's method, and yet he, he failed to apply it um, consistently in this case. But I'll show you. We'll go through those in due course, in due time. Because there's something really a big, big bombshell is going to shock a lot of people, which is written on that Dome of the Rock inscription. Um, but no, this is uh, this Dome of the Rock does speak out against adoptionists. It doesn't like adoptionists. It doesn't like adoptionism. And uh, it doesn't like uh, the uh, the idea of, of being a, a, a sort of a, 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 a divine counterpart on the earth to God, as the all the emperors did. You know, they, they came to this. Um, sort of uh, uh, agreement uh, in the time of Abdul Malik, basically making peace between people who had come from two very different backgrounds. Some people had come from Zoroastrian tradition, where it was normal for their emperors to be a god on earth, and um, other, that's the Sasanian religion at least, and the Sasanian version of Zoroastrianism. And others were coming from the Semitic background where such a thing was impossible, impossible to con contemplate. Um, so, um, and you have to also remember the location. This rock that the Dome of the Rock is um, uh, around, it's nothing to Christians or in Christianity. It has never been anything for Christians. It's been completely insignificant. There are only one kind of people who have ever gone up to visit and pray at that rock that the Dome is encasing. And that is the, the, the Judaic people. This uh, whole um, little uh, complex, it, it's not visible from anywhere except when you're inside trying to pray towards facing this, this rock, which incidentally has been prohibited by rabbinical Judaism. They prohibit Jews from doing that, but Karite Jews still do it. Okay. And other Listen, pipe, we don't, we don't, we don't want to get too much into this. That will be a whole other time for another place. It's, it's I just want to bring that up there because not everybody and myself probably won't agree with you on this, but that's, we'll, 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 now. we'll we unpack that later now. on. Let's but go to number nine. Once it's unpacked, you're going to be shocked. All right, okay. then. so next step. <laughs> I'm willing to be shocked. I'm not going to say I will be shocked because I'm not sure that you're looking at what was happening politically as well as what was happening theologically oh, no, in that time I, and in that place. Look, look we're, we're kind of um, spoiling the, 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 the book by looking at the end before we've looked at the story. But uh, I understand you're going to give me the chance to explain the whole story. Yes, you're needed, you'll need to convince me and an awful lot of other people yeah. that you are correct. Let's go to number yeah, nine. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the point is, if you follow this troubleshooting step and understand that if it's using the word shirk, it's not against uh, Christians. It's already um, um, it's already bashed the modalists on the head. It's bashed the tritheists on the head. It's bashed the adoptionists on the head. What kind of Christians are left? You know, it's not it's not bashing them on the head again. This time it's dealing with another sect, which it's got to deal with, and that's the Zoroastrians. So it's bashing them on the head now. And then if that hasn't worked, then look at step nine. Is it a monophysite tradition? Is it a monophysite tradition? Does this uh, passage that you're looking at, although it may be something which is outside of uh, Roman Christianity, is it something that the monophysites would have liked? Now, monophysites are a kind of Christians who, who believe that Jesus was entirely of divine origin, in, as we saw in that little picture of the Trinity, which is described in, in the Quran, um, or sorry, in the uh, Umayyad texts. Uh, is entirely of divine origin, and because he's of a divine origin, can simply transform into a human if he wants to. He can. He he's he visited Abraham as three angels. He appeared to Moses as a burning bush and a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. So it's very easy for him to just appear as a human being or a baby born of of of, of Mary and to to grow up and live and eat and 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 be crucified as as any normal human being would be. This is a, this is um, actually called. Severian uh, monophysitism. Uh, it's, a, it's a classical form of monophysitism in the, in the Oriental Orthodox Church. So is it a monophysite tradition? Does it, is, it, is it a record of something which would have been um, sort of 
um, uh, 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 complementary to monophysite beliefs. For example, the Gospel of Thomas. Oh, there you go. You see, even as a child, he was divine. He could do these miracles as a child. He didn't have to wait until he was adopted by the Holy Spirit at baptism to do these things because he was always divine. There you go. You've got this um, other um, infancy gospel where he's speaking to his uh, his mother from, uh, from the cradle because he was divine. So these things are things which might be supporting a monophysite view, and they would have been sympathetic to those ideas, even though it's foreign to a Roman Christian audience. So in other words, is it a monophysite tradition? That's the other thing that you might want to dismiss. If it is, then you've solved that. Next step, go on to the next step. If it, if it hasn't solved the problem, go on to the next step. Cross-reference the problem word for alternatives. Okay, if you think that this verse is still uh, problematic and it's still causing, it, it, that they're, they're, that they're um, presenting you with a, 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 an interpretation of a verse which seems to be only possible to be interpreted in one, one way, cross-reference, try and identify which word in the verse is the problem, which word is the obstacle, and then cross-reference in your corpus.quran.com or other word-for-word for word source for um, alternatives. You can usually click through to have a look at how many times this word occurs throughout the uh, Abbasid Quran, and you'll um, see that Often enough, you'll find that there are so many different ver so many different occurrences that there's going to be at least one or two different meanings, which give you an alternative meaning, and that will change the entire uh, meaning of the of the verse for you. So that's probably going to solve a lot of a lot of problems. Um, for example, uh, you might have the, a verse which says, oh, "We believe in, in in Jesus and Moses and the prophets, and we make no distinction between them." And you say, "Well, there you go." That's what they're saying. They say it, it doesn't. There's no distinction between them, and uh, that means that they don't make a distinction between Jesus and the and the other um, prophets. He's just a prophet. But then, of course, if you look through the cross reference, cross reference, you'll see this word doesn't say distinction. It means division. So, in fact, it's saying we don't divide uh, the believers of Jesus away from the believers of Moses, believers in Moses or any other prophets. We can believe in all of these um, uh, messengers of God, Messiah of God prophets of God, and we don't divide into sects. We're trying to unite ourselves together. It's got this idea of being a, you can be a, a Hebrew and a Christian at the same time. That's basically the idea that they're putting there. So that's the cross-reference for the problem of alternative, problem words with, with alternatives. If that hasn't solved the problem, if the word is still consistently, consistent in meaning, my suggestion to you is consider a Judo-Arabic uh, meaning. We've looked at Judo-Arabic briefly. I've suggested that the uh, the Umayyad texts were written in Judah Arabic, and I'm going to explain in some subsequent videos why that's the case. But um, if you're still having problems, then consider a Judo Arabic meaning for the word, and that will probably solve the, the matter. I can give a list of, of common Judo Arabic words which might solve the problems, but I'll, I'll do it at a later date, or if somebody wants to email me at redjudaism at gmail.com, then I'll send you a list of Judo Arabic words which can be helpful in that situation. And finally, if you're still having a problem with the verse, then contact me with your payment details ready. And if I can't explain or find that I've missed a, a step in this troubleshooting key, then um, you definitely deserve a reward. Okay, so hold on. So, Joe, what you have been saying here and what's going on here, Joe, is this troubleshooting key that you have put up there, this key of 11 steps and a 12th step uh, demanding... Contact me, yeah. Contacting you and demanding yeah. recompense because um, if I can't explain found, it, yet. Yeah. you have yeah. found yeah. a problem in in uh, in the first eleven steps. Really, yes. is a is a way to help Muslims under really un Muslims understand that the two different you might say two different renditions of what became the Quran, the Umayyad hadiths that you're saying is from yeah. the seventh century, written by the Umayyads in the seventh century. And written with really good intent of confronting these many different heresies that existed at that time. Christian heresies and Jewish Christian heresies that existed at that time. Yeah. Has mm -hmm. been clouded over and ameliorated and deleted and accreted and corrupted, you might say, by the Abbasids after 750 in the mid-8th century and later. And if 
that's why when and I mean, this is uh, this is something that has come up we have had this problem for well goodness for me for over 40 years where muslims have come up to me the uh the dawah team uh, many of those at speaker's corner they keep on throwing these you believe this and you believe that and you believe and i'm saying no i don't believe that but where are you getting it well because the quran in chapter 4 verse 171 says this and the Quran, especially in chapter 5 there's reference after reference after reference of seeming uh I, as I would say, heresies. These are heresies. They're not, they don't represent yeah. me. Chapter 5, verse 72, chapter 5, verse 75, chapter 5, verse 116, or chapter 6, verse 101, that I, that God had a wife. I don't believe God had a wife. I don't believe Mary's part of the Trinity. I don't believe any of this. Well, so where are these all coming from? What you're saying is, don't be surprised. They're in there because that is what the original Umayyad Hadith were all about. They were attacking these very heresies. Yeah. The heresies did exist. They were percolating all over this area in that part of the world, in Iraq and in Syria and in Jordan, what is today Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, what is today Iran, all those areas in the north, these sectarian beliefs uh, of God. And you put them down to the tripart Christology, uh, a prophet, king, and priest. You put it down to modalism, the, the idea that all, that all three are together in, uh, in the, the uh, all three persons of the Trinity are in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, the tritheism. Now, interestingly, you did put up pictures of Hindu gods, and I don't know, I hope people won't come back and throw that, oh, he's, Hinduism didn't exist at that part of the world. You're not saying that this is Hinduism, you're just giving in a, a present-day example of tritheism. Yes, in, because in, we can't find, uh, we can't find amongst Christians today any example of tritheism, so I had to use it. So that's why you're trying to define yeah. what tritheism in a modern day context, in a modern day context, yeah, in a Hindu context, and then you talked yeah. about the Judaizer Nazarene adoptionists uh, that Jesus was adopted as God at his baptism. But you're, yeah. uh, and then you come to this Mesopotamian paganism, which you believe, which is fascinating because really what you're talking about here is this this reference to Sharkatul or a Shirk, uh, the idea shirk. Mm -hmm. uh, that the associators, uh, which I've always assumed were the the all Christians. You're saying no; these are those. Uh, like the Zoroastrians who believe uh, they would elevate their emperor to a status of divinity. Um, yeah. I think the word apotheosis is one that you use yes. to, su to support this. And that's apotheosis, henosis, apotheosis. Yeah. What are the other, what's the other ones you have? Hen henosis. In, in Neoplatonism, it's called henosis. And uh, generally, apotheosis, apotheosis is another one I think yeah. it's that yeah. you can put in there. So these are the, this paganism that existed and was part of that percolation there. And then the monophysite tradition that Jesus is one, has only one divine nature. Uh, yeah. that does not have human nature. So these are the ones that we're going to look for. These are the ones you say can exist. These are the ones that you need to see um, when you peel back all these layers that the Zoroastrians, I'm sorry, not the Zoroastrians, the uh, Abbasids have introduced. <laughs> you might as well say Zoroastrians. You know, because you are, you okay, to, because because you're saying that these are Persian, these are... Uh, the opposites were. They were basically trying to bring back the good old days. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to... But old Zoroastrian, of, the old Zoroastrian yeah. ideals. Okay. Yeah. Zoroastrian oh. laws. Zoroastrian, because, I mean, Zoroastrians are very nice people these days. But, but, but that's because they don't have an empire which covers half the world. You know, but in the olden days, you look at the Sasanians, you know, their, their legal system, their um, uh, divination, divinization of their emperors... They had these little cubs, these little cubes all over the empire with their little idols and 360 idols in them as well. So, you know, this was, I think that the Sasanians were trying to bring him back. And of course, look at the Sasanian symbol, the crescent moon and star. The, the, the Abbasids were trying to bring all that back. And it took a long time. And it's a, um, maybe it's even still an ongoing process. It, was, it took an awfully long time to try and bring back. Uh, that Sasanian religion, essentially, yeah. All right, that's interesting. Let's listen. So this key that you're putting out there, and you're putting it out, even you're putting money behind your uh, be behind your claim, because you're willing yeah. to say that if anybody, once you go through these 11 categories, boom, 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 starting with the allegations of, accept, of, of, of translation, looking at the word themselves in Corpus Quran or um, uh, Quranic Gateway, reverting to the uh, uh, the word Allah itself, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, and the Father and the Son, and yeah. going through each of the tripart, modalism, tritheism, adoption of the paganism, monophysitism, and all so cross-referencing the words with alternatives and then also look at judeo uh, judeo arabism arabism if you're saying yeah. if you look through these 11 steps yeah. and you still cannot find that proto-quran or do you do still not find really what was going on in, in the seventh century you're willing to pay 500 dollars 
to yeah, if they contact if they contact me and say look i've been through all these 11 steps uh, the, the, the 12th step is contact me tell me what the problem is it might be that it's it's one of a few exceptional circumstances which uh, which would just take far too long to explain so i i could actually give the answer but i but uh, if it's not one of those uh, exceptional circumstances or, or um, uh, I can't explain it, then um, I'll give you the 500, if, if, if that's how much I've got in the bank account now that I can give you, um, to say basically a reward. And, well, thank you for pulling a hole in this system, because it's not something that I believe in. It's a system which works. It's just a system that I've found works. That's all. And I'd like to have as many people as possible try it out and see if they can also get it to work. And if they find a hole in it, then that's great. You're actually helping me, you know, test the hypothesis. So uh, I'll well, give you a reward might break for helping me by doing this. What if a five or six? Well, only one. The first, the the, I'm, first come, first serve. <laughs> so if you okay, so, so oh, you only give it to the first one that is able to find a hole in it. Okay, now yeah. just to be clear, just so we're all clear, what you're saying basically is the Abbasid Quran that we have in our hand today. This is the Abbasid Quran. So this is it right here the Quran, Abbasid Quran, that we have in our hand today, has corrupted so much of the earliest Quran, but we can go back and find what that earliest Quran is by using these well, 11 steps. Using, use, using these you want people to use to... these 11 steps to go back and see what do these verses actually say? Who are they? Actually say, yeah. What group yeah. are they actually confronting? When you do that, you can pretty much come back and reproduce that earliest Quran. Pretty much, I think. Of course, um, you know, there's going to be passages which have been deleted and burned and lost forever. We are never going to see, for example, the word Thaluth, Trinity, should be there, but it's not in the, the Quran anywhere. The word Masihi, Christian, should be there, but it's not in the Quran anywhere. These verses have gone forever. But at least what they've left behind in this Abbasid version, apply these, seven, these 11 steps, or the 12th step, if there's a, an exceptional circumstance, which I can explain for you, and you, uh, you will come at a very different looking book, essentially a kind of a monophysite uh, Christian uh, Jewish or Jewish Christian text, which I, I, the explanation that we can give it later. But, you know, I've, I've done the video before about the conversion of Omar to Christianity. He was a he was a Jewish messiah figure who was coming in to build his thing and then he converted to Christianity. So with that in mind, it's all, well, obviously this text would be. A Jewish Christian text, or at least a Jew who's converted to Christian type text. So apply what kind of Christian? Monophysite Christian. So apply that rule, and there you go. You found okay. actually. So you're these, saying the uh, yeah. proto Quran is a monophysite Jewish Christian text. Yeah, so that's right. And, and we're not here to try to define everybody or try to support and everything. No. And also, I can see some people are going to kick back and say, "Listen, you have not if uh, you have uh, you have not done a good definition of modalism. They will not probably agree with your view on tritheism or even tripartism." I uh, haven't. Yeah. I've, I've actually tried to avoid the definitions of these. I just put the uh, the images up there to compare so that you can uh, decide. You know, okay, how would you describe it? Because look. Uh, how many thousands of years were, were uh, how many hundreds of years were the Christians fighting of, of, on over definitions because uh, one person's choice of a word was not the other, the way the other person would choose to use the same word, and so they had this heresy and, and excommunicated each other and stayed enemies for hundreds of years, and then finally patched things up and said, "Oh, is that what you meant by that word? I'm sorry." You know, so of course, uh, human language is very limited, and when we're trying to define these things and talk about these things, Christology, theology, it's very difficult. But um, I put those images up there so that you can get a, a comparison in your head. So you have some kind of well, idea. Let me, okay, ask, let me just say this. So before we, we do need to end yeah. this up, let me just ask this very quickly. The whole yeah. purpose of this key, the whole purpose of this exercise yeah. <clears throat> is to help people who are talking to Muslims face to face when yeah. they come up with different views of who they think Christians beliefs about Jesus. We can go back and say, we can understand your confusion. We can understand why you're uh, you're. You're, you're giving us, you're defining for us what you believe because your Quran has it. Your Quran is so confused. But the reason it is confused is because of all these overlays that have come Definitely. out between the 7th, 8th, and 9th century. Let's take you back to the original Quran. Let's take you back to, by using your key here, let's take you back to yeah. the Umayyad Hadith. And what you yeah. will find that these are ongoing discussions, these are ongoing debates that were happening in the 7th century. Yes. Yes, very much so. By monophysites, primarily against the other sectarian groups. Primarily, and also including some debates which were going on between Jews as well. 
um, in their in the in the, in the Mishnah and, and, and rabbinical sort of ideas as well. So okay. it's clearly I think we should just leave it there because I don't want to get yeah. into a whole harangue about what yeah. each yeah. what each group uh, de, um, um, de, defines himself as. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting here all day doing that. Let's yeah. put yeah. it at that. Let's put the the challenge out there for all of those who are listening now. Joe has put out this key. Try and work through this key and see if you can agree with him. Now, what we're going to do, I think, in the next episode, we're going to actually apply it to yeah. different verses, like chapter 4, verse 171. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We will. Well, um, hopefully, what I'm, what I hope to do, if, if we can, if, if successful, is I'll throw some verses at you. You apply the key and uh, see what it, what it, what, what you get out of it. I'll do some examples first, and then we'll throw it back and see and. The, the important thing is I want to see that this key is possible to be used by anybody, that anybody can use this key when a Taoist sort of throws their verses at you. You, you can use this key and um, use that verse right back again. <laughs> so it will throw it right back at them and say, well, actually, you know what? There's a ton of uh, uh, information on, uh, on the evolution of the Quran, and there's a lot of information that it should suggest that it was written by Christians in the first place, or at least some kind of Christian converts. And uh, this is what the verse looks like it says to me. And uh, that would be, uh, I think, ideal situation. If people are able to use this key to restore that meaning, then that would be great if, if they can. Okay. All right. Well, you've put the challenge out there. You've all heard it. Come back to, how will they get in contact you with you, by the way, if they, want, if they believe that they have been able to find a hole in your key? Send me an email, redjudaism at gmail.com. Okay. And we'll put this right down here. You can see it. I've written it right down here. Red judaism at gmail.com okay that's right you got it you've all heard it now apply it and see if it works listen thanks joe for coming on board uh let's see what people do come back with uh, i'm not sure that i will be able to use the key i, I know you're think, you're thinking that if if i can do it anybody can do it well let's see i'm not even sure that i can use the key but i will try and we'll do that in the next episode all right this is jay and joe three thousand miles apart over and out <music> Thank you.